Kramers, today I have the pleasure with interviewing Los Angeles world-renowned artist and one of my really good friends, Ty Joseph. Ty Joseph has a new uh, art exhibit going out this month at the Beverly Center. He is originally from Hamburg, Germany, of uh, parents who was a Navy officer and a ceramics artist. At the age of six, he moved to Israel and then served in the Israeli military for three years. He then moved to America where he toured around as a musician and settled in Los Angeles, making his way into the nightlife industry. In 2016, he started making art and he had his first solo show just one year later in 2017. He's been taking pictures of celebrities around Los Angeles for the past few years using his LG G5 camera, which is now four years old. Ladies and gentlemen, Ty Joseph. How are you today, buddy? I'm good, Jameson. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you for coming. I like the introduction. It's, it was so inaccurate, but, um, <laughs> but I love it, you know, because it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, be details, you know, what do they matter? <laughs> details don't matter. Well, I wanted to jump straight away into a topic that actually matters. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, the Free Britney movement. You want to start with that? Okay. Um, what, what, do you, what do you think? I'm glad what? that I'm interesting enough <laughs> for you to start with Britney. Um, I, I know that Britney Spears and her quote unquote freedom is a topic that's incredibly dear to you. Again, you know, the, the, it is a misconception that it's very dear, but I, you know, it, no, it, there's some truth to it. You know, uh, I, I don't get upset very easily. I'm a very laissez-faire person, you know, whatever happens and, and, you know, but when, when it comes to, uh, situations where, uh, and you know, I don't care, you know, that Britney is famous and I wasn't specifically inspired by her at any point in time in my life. You know, there was one time that we had a poster of her in a hotel in Paris and that was nice, but otherwise, <laughs> um, you know, it was not something, you know, Britney wasn't really in the, in the center of my life. But, you know, Britney is a very hardworking person. She's been working since she was, uh, I'm sure it's eight or 10 or, you know, she, she's been working all her all of her life getting directed by, you know, by managers and people and directors and, you know, whoever is managing her life. And, um, and, and you know, what, what can really upset me is, you know, when you, when you see somebody who's worked so hard, it doesn't matter if it's a, it's a famous, you know, pop star or, or somebody who's, I don't know, cleaning toilets, you know, if they're treated, treated unfairly, um, uh, despite their their hard efforts and and whatever they do, and she's very successful, obviously, you know that that can really upset me. That's just the uh, unfair treatment of people that actually are positively contributing through work. Um, so that's that's that can be upsetting, and and I think it's very unfair what's going on with her. It's uh, it's very sad. I mean, I, I'm all about freedom and the freedom to do whatever they you know you wish you 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 do and. Uh, and to treat her like she's uh, a senile person in her 90s uh, that's incapacitated and, and cannot make their, her own decision is, is very upsetting. It's very sad. Yeah, I, I can't believe that the Britney Spears is a judge on an American uh, game show of sorts. And... She has, uh, I, I believe she's still performing in Vegas, right? Maybe maybe due, due to COVID, there's been a little bit of break in that, but she's performing in Vegas, and yet she can't own a cell phone? You know, that's amazing that, that you know, she, she can't even uh, be a witness at her, her own, like, uh, trial or, or whichever, you know, the conservatorship uh, battle that they're, they're having. She can't even speak for herself. It's it's only outside people that are, uh, looks like they're very manipulative and nobody has her best interest. Uh, and, and the judges are, are amazing, you know, by just letting this, this, uh, uh, this, you know, really ugly situation continue uh, where, you know, you have a person that's, you know, in their prime, uh, who might have had like a few moments of, of, of uh, 
you know, a breakdown, which could, you can mm -hmm. understand because she was harassed a lot in her life. And obviously she never had her freedoms, a freedom that she, you know, that, you know, anybody deserves. So you can, you, one could understand that, that this is just un unacceptable. This is, uh, you know, this is a weird situation. It's, it's, I'm glad this is happening. You know, I, I sometimes I'm, I'm not sure about all kinds of movements and, and stuff, but, but this is, um, I think it's symbolic. I think uh, it's almost symbolic to uh, a modern day slavery situation where, where you know, uh, when freedom is on the line, you know, I'm going to stand with, with the, you know, trying, you know, to make sure freedom exists. Um, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I usually don't like to, you know, be too strong opinion, too strongly opinionated about something. But, uh, but in this case, it's very easy for me because I will definitely stand with, uh, with freedom on that one. So Ty Joseph is really well known for uh, his iconic use of the letter L. Um, this book is uh, titled The Meaning of L and was, was your first project, correct? Your first sort of art exhibit was The Meaning of L. That's correct. Tell me how you got to your inspiration for the first starting off as an artist. When I first started, it was a, a not, it wasn't a process, like it didn't come from nowhere. It just, it was a, an actual decision that I made. Okay, now I'm going to be an artist. And, and then I figured, okay, what can I do as an artist? Because, um, I knew inside of me that I did want to create and I did want to um, make at least, you know, my environment or, you know, my, you know, feel, um, feel in tune with, with, you know, with my aesthetics and environment, kind of create an identity for myself as an artist. So, you know, one day after um, some years that I've been working in real estate and, um, I mean, you know, that was good, but I, I fig figured, you know, I, I should be an artist and I I started to sketch and I I came up with the, the shapes of L and put them together in some assortments and and looking at that, I started to recognize um, all kinds of uh, shapes coming out of it. So. So I began to play with those L-shaped elements and, and almost like a, a Rorschach test uh, where, where I start seeing things. I started, you know, making uh, lines around them and putting them in certain elements. And it looked, it looked very aesthetically pleasing to me too. And the colors that I chose, um, I started in 2016 and I, the political climate was not as, maybe not as tense as it is now, but, <laughs> but for those times it was pretty tense and there was, there was a lot of um, a conflict between, you know, left and right and all that. Um, and, you know, I decided to put this conflict into the, so I, I created like conflicting elements and tried to create movement with my, with those, everything worked so well, right? Using just one little shape. Mm -hmm. and, and from that, I, I started to develop the idea of the meaning of L um, because uh, what I did is I took one little element mm -hmm. and little by little um, grew it into having meanings. And after I, I've done my paintings, my first paintings, people started to tell me what they see in the paintings. And these are these were things that I, never even thought about and and that even that's even um uh made the idea of of taking a little piece of something and and just um made it make it guide through make it as a guide through through life as as you know something that can um develop your your personality or identity and this is this is all what this is what the meaning of l is uh, it's it's taking something small and and kind of um, um, make it um, make it into uh, your 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 identity. You know, being in so that's sort of what you're doing now with your with your with your current 
our up and coming uh, exhibit exhibition, you're taking something very simple, nightlife photography and portraits and, and the experience of, of nightlife, which is, you know, we, uh, for the first time in my life, it's been stripped of us and adding it, it back in. So tell me, or tell us, all of the creamers out there, what uh, about this exhibition that, by, by the way, I find it incredibly amazing and uh, and super cool that you're here in Los Angeles and you got the Beverly Center, which if anybody's ever been to Los Angeles, the Beverly Center is probably like the place that you go when you first get here. Like it's the biggest mall, it's got all of the dope stores, you know, Chanel's, Fendi's, Apple's, whatever. And they gave you a spot to display your art right in the middle for what, two months? Yes, yeah. Um, you know, um, the, the year during COVID uh, 2010 wasn't a very productive year for me. And, and um, I was kind of in, in, a, in, a, in a crossroad where I didn't really know where things are going um, because I don't, I, all the art events uh, shut down and I, I didn't really know. There was no, nothing for me to you know, look forward to a plan to. And I, um, I recently started to um, work with my, a good friend of mine, Karen Bystead. Uh, she has a, a gallery at the Beverly Center called The Lost Warhols. And I was helping her with another project. And then the Beverly Center uh, gave her uh, a space for rotating art shows. And that's when I mean Karen spoke and I brought uh, an idea that, you know, I could do a solo art show. I have, I definitely have enough art for it, but you know, the concept didn't, you know, and we decided to go forward with an art show. Uh, we just didn't know exactly what the concept would be. And, you know, I was trying to find something that um, would uh, be uh, in tune with current events, uh, not just my art, and it would be just another show. I wouldn't want to actually do something more meaningful. Uh, and uh, then came the idea of uh, involving the photography that I've been doing for a long, like three years, I guess, uh, before COVID started. And um, th these photographs, you know, I, I, which I like very much, but they weren't, they weren't an exhibit by themselves. I, I didn't feel like I could print those photos and make them, you know, a photography show. So I never knew what to do with them other than, you know, to post them on, on Instagram and, and, and they, they serve another purpose. Uh, like, you know, when I took pictures of people, it will help, it will help me like knowing them, communicate with them and remember them. You know, if I met them out at night and I took a picture and tagged them on Instagram, I later knew who they were and, you know, cause, I could be forgetful. Then came the idea that I can have those hundreds of, of photographs displayed on monitors and just recreate uh, the nightlife um, uh, atmosphere by adding their voices and, uh, and uh, make it uh, where people can approach those monitors and when they approach it, they can hear the voice of the person that's uh, that they see on the monitor, which is from a slideshow of many, many people. So you almost always get somebody new and you hear something um, very unique because every person has their own voice and their own sound and, and, and they all tell different stories. Some of them are, are problems, some mm -hmm. of them are are magical moments, sensational moments that they experienced uh, in nightlife activities. Uh, but it's all very interesting to uh, to to like hear those people, and you almost it's almost if you are out and you're getting to know new people. So, I, and so once I thought about this idea, it it was clear that this is the right thing to do because we're we're um, we're create we're basically maintaining that um, that. Um, aspect of life that's now extinct uh, doesn't exist. You really can't go out to to 
clubs or to bars that are populated like last like like uh, we did we used to do uh, more than a year ago and this this was an element that I really wanted to um, bring back and uh, in an artistic way um, and it's almost like something that's not here anymore and a museum takes and and recreates it and this is this is the essence of this show amazing Ty, so can you tell us how you got set up at the Beverly Center and what you're doing there? I mean, Beverly Center, for anybody who doesn't know, is like the iconic place in Los Angeles. It's when you first get to Los Angeles, you go there first. It, literally, like within, within five days, it's got all of the dope stores, Chanel, Gucci, Apple, maybe not any of those anymore except for Apple. I'm not really sure. I haven't been there in a while. Maybe they all got shut down, but Ty, tell us about how you got in there. You know, as long as they have Macy's. Um, <laughs> Macy's is still there, all right. Yeah. Um, and Bloomingdale's too. Bloomingdale's too. Opposite sides, Bloomingdale's and Macy's. Um, and in between you have all the other stores. Um, how do I got there? I it, this this came from from almost from nowhere. Um, you know, 2020 uh, wasn't much of a productive year for me uh, because uh, everything got canceled. All the art events got canceled, so I didn't really have something to look forward to. Usually, I show a little bit at Art Basel, or I have a, a show or two in LA during that time. There's also uh, the, the shows in LA, the uh, LA art show and freeze, but none of this uh, was happening. So, uh, you know, for me, it was, uh, I was in a crossroad where I, I just didn't know where things are happening and I wasn't doing so much. And, um, I, my good friend, Karen Bysted, who, uh, is, is a great artist herself and a very, uh, very diligent person that works uh, very hard. She, she has a gallery at the Beverly Center and with her brand, The Lost Warhols. And she, um, she received a, a space uh, uh, for rotating art shows at mm -hmm. the Beverly Center. And I was working on a little project with her where the idea came from me to do a show there, uh, my own show um, at that rotating uh, art show space. Um, and of course, you know, having not a lot going on, I, I jumped on that opportunity, even though I didn't really know what I was going to do. Uh, I'm a painter. I have my paintings. Uh, that was obvious for me that I can show my paintings, but I was looking to do something that's more in tune with, uh, with current events or something that would, um, have some sort of, um, of a meaning uh, nowadays or or relevance to 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 people so so it's it's new and it, and it's exciting and it's not something that people uh, are already used to uh, and then came um, then I knew that uh, I could uh, maybe use uh, photographs that I've uh, been taking uh, mostly you know in the time before COVID. I was taking a lot of nightlife uh, photographs of people out. Some of them are, are more known in the public. Some of them are less, but no, nonetheless, they're all very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, their aesthetics is always interesting. Their 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 different poses and and to me, those photographs were always interesting. They they also served a, a purpose for me when I was uh, meeting those people. Uh, it was a conversation opener and it gave me uh, a good um, tool to remember those people because mm -hmm. I, would, I would post them, or let's say on Instagram and, and tag them and I can always remember who that person was that I took a picture of. Uh, so for me, it was always a tool that I like to have. But now, uh, and, and, and you know, other than that, I didn't really know what to do with it because I didn't see value in those pictures to be like, you know, like a, a photography show. They, they weren't strong enough for that, at least in, in, the, in the printmaking uh, aspect as far as I saw it. Um, but here uh, I had an opportunity using those photos to recreate uh, the nightlife atmosphere 
and, uh, and, and bring back those memories and bring back those people where, where me, myself and others, and you know, hopefully I'm sharing at the Bailey Center so many of the people in LA can, can come and experience uh, these same same things that I've experienced. So I figured we we can uh, we want to take a bunch of um, TV screens, monitors, and install them in the space and have slideshows of those photographs to show those people, but also uh, incorporate an audio element to it where people can get close to the to the screen and then hear the person uh, say something. And it can be anywhere from you know. Uh, some uh, drunk conversation to some um, philosoph philosophical ideas or, or just like uh, uh, some problems that they have or, or excitement moments that they've uh, experienced. There's so many voices and, and, and for me it's very interesting because every person is different and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an entire world that you can experience in that space and there are many, many, many of those photographs and voices. And, uh, and I thought this, this, this is the time to bring something like that where, where it's basically uh, extinct because uh, nightlife doesn't happen anymore, uh, at least for the time being. And um, this is a way for me to preserve this, um, this element of life, which I think is very important. Yeah. Now you are, uh, you're 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 building up this career here in Los Angeles at at a rate which you know I I, I see uh, not many people go. You but you're you're doing it in very interesting ways. Tell me about how you hijacked someone else's art show and turned it into your own art show. Um. <laughs> You're probably talking about uh, what I did at the Jeffrey Deitch Gallery uh, that was in 2019. Um, oh, well, um, again, I was looking for something to do. As an artist, <laughs> you always look looking to create. Um, and uh, I was looking for, for something special, something different to do. And, um, you know, as a begin, beginning artist, uh, let's face it, I'm still, you know, in my beginning stages. Um, I'm not there in the, in the big galleries yet. Um, I wasn't picked by any of them. Um, so, <laughs> so naturally- I, I, I think a lot of our audience can probably relate with, you, you know, with that. <laughs> it depends who your audience is, you know, maybe your audience is very, you know, it's, it's, it's already there, but who knows. Um, but. Uh, you know, I felt naturally. I felt some resentment. Um, not, not really, to be honest. I, you know, I never feel bad about situations that don't happen. I just take what I have, and I'm happy with it. But um, I, I, I was looking for something interesting to do, and I've always noticed that the big galleries they have these extravagant openings, and everybody who's everybody at the art in the art world always attend those um, and I figured you know if I can only um, use this uh, and, and exploit the, the situation in, to my advantage maybe maybe I can create something that that will capture their their interest or at least you know make them angry or something um, <laughs> you know because uh, as an artist again, you just you just want a reaction, I guess. Um, so I, I started to look at the calendar. It was just uh, it was summer, um, and um, I started to see uh, who has an opening, and 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 then figure out what I can do. And I saw that Jeffrey Deitch has an opening for Judy Ch Judy Chicago. Uh, and I figured I'll go, you know, I've been to the gallery many times, but never looked at it as something that I, you know, as, as a project. So I went to the gallery again and, and start looking around the street and start in, in the gallery and, and figuring what can I do that's legal yeah. and, and still capture um, people's attention. 
and uh, I figured, you know, that the, you know, there's a st there's a street across the way, and and at the beginning I thought maybe I can drive a vehicle with the paintings or something, or but there's a street across the way, and, and with uh, certain parking parking restrictions that say that you can't park between the hours of 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. daily. So, well, I knew that the street is empty every night between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Um, and then I developed this concept where I can park a big moving truck, uh, one that has like a white side to it, just like a wall that I can use to hang my paintings. And um, even though it was a little too out of the box almost, too, too um, daring, uh, I went ahead and did it. Uh, I found a guy with a truck and uh, he was really cool. I'll get back to mm -hmm. this in a second. He did something I couldn't imagine. You couldn't imagine what he did. But, uh, uh, but I found a truck and I set up the truck to come to my place uh, before the show and we hung a few paintings and my paintings are, you know, are relatively big paintings. And uh, this is a little bit where it, uh, we we didn't plan it right and it took us a little bit more time than we thought to install those paintings on the, tr the truck but um, beforehand we had to park three cars in front of the galleries at 5 a.m. just when the restriction was uh, out and we could park the, those cars and so we woke up really early parked those cars uh, or didn't go to sleep I don't remember but we parked those cars yeah. it, it was my family was visiting so I used my father and my brother they were here and we parked three cars in front of the galleries the gallery and um, when the opening started we brought this the truck uh, a little late like we were half an hour late but you know that's still in the beginning uh, around 6 30 and uh, like a commando uh, maneuver, we went in the cars, moved three cars simultaneously and parked the truck uh, in that space right in front of the gallery and, and uh, showed those paintings. And that got a lot of reaction, uh, especially a negative one from the galley. People loved it. People that came by, they were, uh, there, there were um, very surprised and, and and excited to see something like that, but the gallery people and Jeffrey Deitch himself got very upset. Um, I wasn't <laughs> there. I was receiving information from people that I knew that are in the gallery. Um, but Jeffrey was furious and he told his people to move this truck no matter what. And those people came and started talking to the driver who then, he, the driver came with his 10-year-old son or something. He was around 10 years old, maybe even um, maybe even less, maybe eight year, years old. And what the driver did is unbelievable. The driver decided to leave his son there so nobody can talk to anybody. People can talk to the boy, but they can't say to the boy, move the truck. The boy can only say, hey, my dad is not here. I can't do anything. So the driver just left. I wasn't there either. Nobody was there. Just everybody left the truck. And this, the, he left his boy there to answer the gallery. That my, my father is going to be right back. He can talk to you. And that's what his answer was. My father is going to be right back. He will talk to you. And in the meantime, they're <laughs> super pissed, trying to figure out whose truck this is, <laughs> who can they get in touch with. And they were so frustrated. Um, it took him like, you know, they constantly tried. And eventually it was 7.30, 7.45. The art show is almost over. And then they gave up. So the truck was standing there the whole time. Yeah. And um, around that time, around the end, I also approached. I was hiding in one of the side street. I didn't want to be seen. But um, I, I went to the gallery eventually. And um, and it was nice. It was nice seeing some of the, you know, I, I was, I you know, my friend filmed Jeffrey Deitch being upset. And it was nice seeing all that. Um, I, can't sh I can't say it changed the world, but... Um, it was definitely an experience. So, um, yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> so doing something like this, like experiential, like disruptive, what, well, you know, I, I, where, I, where does it leave you? Because like, like that, like, I, I feel like that is 
Like that's a precedent. That's a big move. Do you have any plans to do more disruptive measures? Are you gonna try no, to look I, it no, up? No, no, like, Level up next time. In my views, there is nothing disruptive. I, you know, it's it. It reminds me of uh, you know what we just experienced with the GameStop and everything. You know, uh, the, the, some people play the game uh, and keep, continue playing the game where they have the advantage, like the bigger galleries or the mm -hmm. bigger investors. And they they uh, are getting blinded into certain areas where where other people that are thinking oh what can we do better or where can we outsmart those people uh, where they can step in mm -hmm. uh, just you know just like what happened with GameStop where you know people start started buying all those shorted stocks stocks and and forcing the bigger hedge funds to sell. Uh, just in the same way, I was just thinking, how can I take advantage of the situation? And I wasn't trying to be disruptive. I mean, nobody got hurt or anything. Uh, and it was completely legal and everything. So we just parked the truck with other paintings across the way. I wasn't trying to interfere. People enjoyed the two art shows that, mm -hmm. that were coinciding. And um, I can see why the gallery got... No, I don't even see why the gallery got so upset. I mean, maybe it's an ego thing. Uh, other than that, nothing really happened. And yeah, I would love to do uh, things in the you know that are that are you know in in good spirit and not you know and make people eventually just laugh about it. I've you know I I, I would always look for opportunities as an artist. Again, mm -hmm. we try to you know get attention, look for opportunities, and and make something exciting. And you know this is this is. This is part of, of living, you know? We were trying yeah. to make our life interesting, you know? Now, I know you've been working on some really cool uh, moving picture art. Um, why don't you guys watch a little clip right now? So tell us about the what the audience has watched. Um, this is part of uh, another aspect in this art show uh, at the Beverly Center, uh, where when I visited the space, um, it, it used to be a, a retail store, a clothing store, and they still have the fitting booths uh, there. And uh, I didn't really know what to do. You know, I wanted to do something that's that's different in those booths and and capture or utilize the, the intimacy that that uh, is within the booth when you enter, um, and uh, this is an idea that came from uh, we we me and my girlfriend Tyler Marie who is a who is a filmmaker we we dabbled into making some videos and stuff and and we made a small video of mine and which which was only me doing some crafty stuff and and a little bit of an artistic video with a voiceover um, uh, with some philosophical meaning. And I, and I figured, you know, I can develop this concept to be um, a, a contrasting element to, to, the, to the socializing element uh, that we have at the show, uh, the nightlife, the people. I can have something that's more intimate and isolated and to bring in the context of um, of COVID and uh, the quarantine uh, period, where people were by themselves and, and wanting to create and wanting to to do, and maybe they can't go to work, so they do something that's different. Uh, so it's about the creative process uh, within us, within our individuals, within themselves, uh, without the uh, outside elements. And I thought this would be perfect for those booths. So we're gonna be uh, uh, projecting those videos on monitors in those booths, uh, where the the visitor can be one on one with that video and see that person that uh, um, 
have uh, you know they you know they have they're gonna have their voiceover and say something and it's gonna I think it's gonna be very impactful uh, just to be in that booth and and listening and viewing that video. Nice, nice, very cool. So Ty, you've been in nightlife for a really long time, and I know that you have a passion for parties, people, all things entertainment. And I know you throw your own parties, but Wait, you where, like going. But you like going to other parties. Where did you hear that? You know, Ty, we've been, we've been, we've been to our our fair share of parties. We've traveled for parties. We've been to many different types of things. What do you think is going to happen post COVID with the parties? Um. Wow. You. Uh, you definitely. Um, uh, supplied a lot of information here about my mm -hmm. uh, my life, and I appreciate that, Jameson. Um, what do I think will happen with uh, nightlife or parties uh, now that uh, COVID has hit us? I, I don't know. Um, I think you know. I, I'm naturally. I'm a. Um, I think positively, and I'm an optimist. Uh, I'm an optimistic person. So I believe that eventually COVID will slowly fade away and be, you know, part of the human genome and, and kind of like either people had it or they're vaccinated. But in, in some point, I don't know how long it would take, but it will just be a thing of the past, mm -hmm. just like the Spanish flu is a thing of the past and, and other diseases. And, and, and things will go back to normal and people will do what's what you know what naturally um, is uh, desired by them so and, and I know nightlife is desired by a lot of people and dressing up and, and meeting new people and and um, kind of uh, being your own show in a way so anybody that goes out they're kind of their own show and they're there to show themselves and others are there to see the other shows and and, and I think things are going to be and, I don't, and again I don't know how long it would take but things are going to go back to normal um, so I'm not worried of it, about it and if, if, if there's something you know I'm you know when, when I do this show about nightlife I, I'm just um, keeping it, um, you know, keeping it on, on life support, mm -hmm. but I know the patient is going to uh, come out of it and, and everything is going to go back to normal. So I'm not worried. You know, maybe we, we will have less, you know, basement speakeasy type of venues and, and there'll be more airy, uh, at least for the short term, uh, you know, the next few years, uh, everything is going to be open air. Um, but uh, but I, I'm, I have no doubt that um, this element of our lives is, is not going to stop mm -hmm. just because of, of this temporary um, uh, stop of it. Amazing. So why don't you let uh, the creamers know? Uh, how they could find you and your work and, and follow along on your artistic journey. Um, I, I, I am on Instagram. That's pretty much uh, the, the main social media uh, outlet that I use. Uh, it's tyjoseph.la. Um, other than that, um, you know, um, you know, they can call me at, I'm um, just kidding. <laughs> um, but no, Instagram is, is the best way for me to communicate. I can see who those people are and, 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 and their pictures. And, and this is, you know, ever since I started my, uh, to be an artist, um, Instagram was a great tool for me to communicate because I could show my art. I could see other artists, other uh, people um, in the different industries mm -hmm. and uh, and um, and yes I would I would love to get in touch with whoever wants to um, to reach out you know and and if people have questions or or you know want to know my secrets they can always talk to my assistant I'm kidding again you know, <laughs> I'm joking um, amazing yeah. amazing guys uh, if you haven't already, go follow Ty Joseph on Instagram. It's tyjoseph.la. And 
we will see you around soon, I'm sure, Ty. I hope so. I hope so. And thank you so much. Thank for you so much for coming. Cheers. Thanks. Later, guys.